Claudius Dank, the earliest years of human evolution. After the Indian subcontinent rocked its way into the bottom of Asia, pushing up the high relief uh, that's associated with the Himalayas, literally changing the climate cold in the winter months and warm in the summer months, producing a corresponding push and pull of the weather in the Indian Ocean. And this had widespread effects, especially in East Africa. And that main effect was to create very significant dry seasons that previously had existed, but were not all that significant. As a result of this, the larger habitat, this great big giant rainforest, which was the climate beforehand, now we have a climate that, well, it has the same conditions of the rainforest for six months of the year. The other six months of the year, or sometimes longer, came these dry seasons. And these dry seasons were the seasons of death. So water was a big deal in places that were defensible were a big deal such that they had both water and food to survive the dry season. Let me describe one element of the reality that they lived under back then that unless you actually think it through, you're not really going to recognize its importance. And that is in migrating species during the depths of the dry season and their effects on your resources. By I mean your resources, you're talking about the resources that are in your vicinity that you normally eat every day. That, hey, we have these trees over here. We're going to make sure no one else gets them. But suddenly every year, here come these migrating species. And what do they do? They eat all your food. They tear down your trees. They shit in your water. And worst of all is after they leave, predators hang around and once that set in it was maybe only a few days later before every single member of the whole community was was killed literally every single member that's what would happen every single member of the community during the depths of these dry seasons given the the surrounding fauna i guess it's referred to as the ethiopian fauna and that's the fauna that emerged at the onset of this seasonality Well, these animals would have been the bane of our existence in the earliest years, especially during the dry season. Because the only chance a community had was to keep them from getting in in the first place. And that would require our earliest ancestors to gradually now, you know, as evolution proceeds, right, all these communities are getting wiped out. Well, there's going to be some variants where they're a little bit more cooperative than the other ones, and so therefore they are better able to recognize and come to help each other and increase the probability that they survive by way of the fact that they just dissuade. You know, you don't really even have to work that hard at it, really, at first, because the, these in-migrating species, they're just going to travel to wherever they get the least resistance, right? They're not really going to be too worried about what exact place they go. Oh, there's all these pain-in-the-ass chimps down there. I don't want to go that way, they'll go another way. And so by way of just starting to be a, a nuisance to these other species, our hominid ancestors began, and by working together to do that too, because you know that's really what scares these animals, our earliest ancestors began to um, establish themselves in this, in this niche in the environment. We can also think of this behavior as being the earliest form of war in the sense that it would involve strategically taking positions, creating a line of opposition to prevent the onset of groups of other species, could even be predators, and collectively work together to create a deterrent so as that you can protect your habitat and your water supply. A unit of selection never goes completely to one level or another. It just kind of shifts the degree it's at one level relative to another. And this is a situation where the, it shifted significantly to the level of the community. 
And any community who had whatever behaviors were complementary to it not being uh, a victim of these predatory massacres. And, you know, there's a all number of capabilities that might be involved in this. Three categories. One is war, using weapons, trying to actually kill or hurt the enemy and to protect the territory. Number two is agriculture. You're keeping pests out. It's pest control, protecting resources. And the last one, and this is where I think it really kind of ties it together here, and that is fan-based behaviors. Another set of concerns involves my thinking about um, bipedalism and why I think it's extremely unlikely that it had much to do with locomotion. In fact, I think it suggest the emergence of an animal who is generally more sedentary than we think of as an animal in a more open savanna habitat. So this form of bipedalism does allow them to hold things in their hands and to throw things. But bipedalism mostly had to do with the fact that we displayed fan-based behaviors. And when I say fan, I'm saying like sports fans. We acted like sports fans in the earliest years of hominid evolution because that's what was especially selective in the context of keeping animals out of garden habitat, which was extremely important because every year there was a dry season in which any hominid communities that lost control of their garden habitat would have it overrun. They would then have tigers come in and camp out for a month or so and pick every one of them off, literally, literally killing every last member of the community. And that happened every year to at least one of the 10 to 20 different communities within a greater region. Throwing rocks, creating a ruckus, yelling collectively, getting excited and, and uh, making a show of it. Doing your best to keep these animals out of your garden habitat. And this was just a common part of life. Now keep in mind these communities are made up of hundreds or thousands of, of family units. So they could have tens of thousands of individuals and each one of these we can think of this as just a greater hominid population living in a in a landscape just like we do now there must have been a compelling reason for the emergence of bipedalism the shift in arm structure and the shift in posture associated with the earliest years of hominid evolution now keep in mind this is when we still had curved phalanges and also feet with curved toes we were still adapted to trees but yet we see that we're also fully bipedal which means that maybe the trees are only around for under emergency situations much of the time we were on the ground you know what would give you that huge selective difference when really the difference in their habitat was only different six months of the year and they were still mostly dealing with the same animals and the same, you know, relative um, part of the ecosystem, the relative niche of the of the greater ecosystem. So what would cause them to begin to evolve so rapidly in this particular direction? The answer, of course, is because we evolved from those who were able to best keep those animals out of our habitat. So the compelling reason for bipedalism was that that behavior was so central to our survival. That behavior being this ability to keep animals out of our habitat. Because remember, if we didn't do that, we most likely wouldn't survive the dry season. And the fact that part of that behavior would start to involve things like carrying sticks and stones to certain locations to set up your lines. Because you're basically, you're, you're acting like an army and so you're bringing your, your weapons with you. And you're making a line and you're, you're doing uh, all this in a relatively coordinated fashion. Or you're just standing up and making a show of force just by way of standing, by looking bigger and by collectively shaking trees and stuff and making a ruckus and, and throwing things. And so for all these reasons, we became bipedal because it was so essential that we kept these animals out. Because if we didn't, we would all, literally every one of us in the community, the whole community would die during the dry season. So it's very much tied to that shift in climate as a result of the appearance of this highly seasonal monsoon habitat. That's what they refer to that as, as monsoons, monsoon habitat. And so human evolution undoubtedly 
was a process that shifted selection that not only did an animal have to survive on the regular basis, now it had to survive on the basis of collectivizing together to fight against other species to keep them out of your habitat. But to do so, not originally having a rational understanding of that end at all. Instead, you're just caught in this cycle where you're, you're constantly doing what you have to do to keep those animals out of your garden habitat. And that's the main thing about human evolution for the first million years. We were caught in that cycle, in that yearly cycle, and it's not something that we could really escape from. And we were all relatively small cities and stuff, but we weren't in any way organized because human evolution was just happening. What I mean by that is that those selective factors were just part of the environment, and the result was the selection of animals that are like ourselves. So there was never any kind of going from certain size of groups to larger size of groups or anything like that. Group sizes have to do with geographic factors more than they do anything else. No, what was really happening was there was this general shift in, in evolution. That was war back then. That was also agriculture. That was everything. That was entertainment too. And that was what humans did for the next couple millions of years. And we were stuck in this. We had no way of getting out of it. But our ancestors were stuck in it because of the dry season and because the biota had shifted to these really aggressive, highly migratory species. And water scarcity became a big deal in the dry season. And therefore, being able to protect water was a big deal. So our ancestors, their strategy was to find the, the place that has good water, good fruit, and occupy it and work to keep other animals out of it. But note that there's no part of the habitat that requires special behaviors other than just that thing of taking the line and keeping those animals out. And that being our, our constant war, our constant agriculture, our constant entertainment, all three of those. The trick though is how you give them the incentive to show up on that front line year after year, every day, or whenever it's needed, maybe not all the time every year, but you need people to show up and they gotta be ready to work collectively and work cooperatively and create a line and create a ruckus. But you had to incentivize them to do that. So it was essential to the origins of hominids for there to be civility, which I know sounds strange. The reason why it's so necessary to maintain civility is to maintain the ability to keep the animals out of your habitat. That's the ultimate end of civility. Civility is a big part of the equation for how hominids began to evolve to be hominids. And so we get to see these different elements of what it means to be human and they're building organically because so much of what we are could not have evolved in the context of anything but civility. And that, of course, is a different understanding of human evolution. So uh, civility is not something that, that came on the scene recently. It's not something that we arrived at through rationality. It's something that came on the scene in the earliest years of hominid evolution and without which all of the other things that make us human could not have evolved. In a sense, civilization began in the earliest years of hominid evolution, or at least that's what my theory suggests. Now, I know that sounds really confusing, and I think that's because we look at civilization as being about cities and buildings therein and organization thereof. That's what we see as civilization, even though that's really just you know, that's just the artifact of civilization. So I think a better word to use is civility. Civility is just a more typical word that just says, hey, we treat each other in our vicinity with respect and kindness. So I believe that a lot of human traits could not have evolved, would not have evolved, if not for the fact that we were mostly in a context in which civility was a big part of the equation. So civility, was something that had to be established at the earliest years of hominid evolution. And therefore there needed to be a reason for civility to be so selective in the earliest years of hominid evolution. You know, you can't just say, well, I just want this to be the case. 
But um, I think that reason is provided by uh, our model. Our model being that hominids were under extreme selective pressure to achieve collective goals. There was just no, um, there was no in between on that. They either achieve those goals or they will die. That's what the environment shifted into in the earliest years of hominid evolution with the onset of that severe monsoon dry season. That also shifted the fauna therein uh, in the wider area, meaning the, um, the animals. They became more migratory and they became more vicious. Big animals appeared on the scene. Treeless habitat appeared on the scene creating kind of islands of hominid habitat, oases of hominid habitat in this greater desert during the dry season. The greater habitat was still very patchy. Wasn't a, um, wasn't a jungle anymore, but it wasn't really a wide open savanna either, even though from the perspective of our earliest hominids, it didn't matter because they had no chance in the open habitat. There would be no reason for them to go there. In that, and now I'm talking about in the earliest years, they had, um, they were completely dominated by the other animals in treeless habitat. So they would have stayed in treed habitat. They would have stayed at places where water was not a problem, or um, they would have they would have stayed near water. They would have stayed near places that we would today we refer to as good real estate. You know, so if you want a definition of what that part of the land uh, looked like in the earliest years of hominid evolution, well, just look at what good real estate looks like now. <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty straightforward. Now, uh, you know, according to my theory, as I think should be clear to everybody by now, if, if if this is not clear, then you should go back and read what my theory is about. Every year they had to do something to keep those animals out of their habitat, and the most you know the most likely course thereof is to get everybody else involved in some way, and that would have to become kind of a general group behavior. And the only way for that to happen in reality is that they're getting along with each other. So the ability to get along with each other and the tendency to collectively fight other animals who are trying to get into your habitat and actually literally go to war against them to keep them out, these abilities would be very precisely selected in the earliest years of hominid evolution. It wouldn't be long before animals like ourselves, in terms of our general nature, in terms of occupying a territory, collectively and cooperatively maintaining it and keeping other animals out of it, pest control, and also enjoying doing that along the lines of it being like a sporting event and at one of the same time it being the, the actual behaviors of war because it involves sticks and stones, yelling, mob-oriented attacks. So the behavior that's necessary for the earliest years of hominid evolution would have to be largely consistent with what our chimpanzee-like ancestors do instinctually already anyways. In other words, they're already, even before, in their jungle habitat, before the emergence of this dry season, our chimpanzee-like ancestors were already territorial, already cooperating with their neighbors. They're already using sticks and stones. These are not large jumps from chimpanzee behavior. And here's an aspect of this greater environment, of this greater, this form of evolution and the, and the type of competition that it creates. This ability to keep animals out of your habitat would have tremendous selective advantage because those who could not do that or could not do that as well would just disappear. It was that simple and it was that stark. And funny thing about it, we might not even notice that. Not in the earliest years of hominid evolution, 
we wouldn't even know about it, even if it was like only five miles away. So human evolution was the result of the fact that our earliest ancestors had to, every year, put together a, an effective deterrence to in-migrating species by whatever means necessary. So there's going to be a selective process that's going to evolve these group dynamics associated with whatever is better at achieving this. Now, the whole point is that we're just saying that the selective factors here are now based on in communities that can achieve the right behavior at the right time amongst its different disparate members is going to have a huge selective advantage over communities that do not. And keep in mind, the ultimate criteria is whether or not you can get a deterrent to those in migrating species. That was what mattered. And we are the descendants of our ancestors over millions of years who have been the best at doing that. Whatever it took to get that to happen on a consistent basis over millions of years is what evolved. In a sense, we can think of that process of making sure that happens as politics. It's about whether you make the right decisions in your larger society to survive and be able to consistently keep those animals out of your habitat. We were therefore caught within that context for millions of years, and we were not really fighting with each other that much. Now, maybe that was part of it also, but I think we had our hands full dealing with these other species. A shift in habitat, environment, climate, or some combination thereof must explain the sudden onset of human evolution. In other words, there can't really be any other kind of internal mechanism. There has to be something externally, kind of like a law of evolution. You can't just, oh, they suddenly figured out how to do this. You know, they suddenly figured out cooking. That's one that's really popular. Or they suddenly started using tools. You know, they hadn't thought of it before, and now suddenly they just thought of it. Or they suddenly realized that because they could walk long distance that they now had a huge habitat available to them. These are not good theories. There's a lot more questions here. Amongst the biggest of them is, what is the origins of human intellect? You know, what selective factors favored intellect? favored animals like ourselves rather than other animals that could fit within the, the structure of any kind of a... We could form communities. It wasn't like a, that was any magic. You just got along with your neighbor. So none of this suggests that intellect would start to be selected for, or at least it doesn't yet. So one of the confusing things about hominid evolution is that there appears to be a contradiction with respect to us being a rational animal and it goes like this, is that for the longest time, we've had this theory that tool use was kind of the engine of human intellect along the lines that you use a tool at first, maybe not very well, but good enough that it allows you to survive better than, than if you didn't use the tool. And that that would lead to more tool use and there'd be kind of a positive feedback and that would bring us down the path of hominid evolution to eventually get humans. Well, that idea really doesn't work. First of all, there's really no tools that are really all that useful. Also, tool usage really shows up most prominently about two million years after, or at least two, two million years after hominids have been said to evolve. Tool usage appears to be a result of the fact that we had evolved intellect, and so there must have been some other engine. before there was this incredible extinction event at the end of the Pleistocene. You could not have occupied these lands. That extinction of these large mammals is what allowed humans to expand onto locations like Mesopotamia and to actually achieve large cities and large cities that were well connected to each other economically. If you tried to do that in the Pleistocene, you would have been so completely overwhelmed with animals, you wouldn't know what to do. About 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Well, actually, it's the Younger Dryas event. That's the event that erased large mammals from our planet, essentially. Not all of them, of course, because we do see some survivors. 
but um, there's been some really incredible developments along these lines that it might be the sun that is the cause of the extinction that that began the Holocene, which is frightening because it suggests that the sun has this ability to just just suddenly act funny and put out all this energy that wipes life off our planet. So human evolution was mostly focused on the ability for a community to defend itself against other species and all of the things associated with, with making them better at doing that. Does that make sense? Probably not. Let me see if I can explain it a little bit better. Or maybe I can first of all just repeat it so it's clear in my own mind. Human evolution is primarily focused on what is necessary to create a deterrent from these in-migrating uh, species during the dry season to thereby survive the dry season. And all of the things associated with making sure that happens year after year after year. If they don't show up on the front line, if they don't do the fan base behavior, if the whole community is not involved in this, especially when it's most needed, they won't be able to keep the animals out. They will not survive the dry season. Because once those animals come in, they destroy the food, they destroy the water, and uh, they bring in predators. And it becomes a killing field, and then they leave. The, you know, the migratory species leave, but the predators stay behind, and they literally pick off the humans one by one. What behaviors would we think they would start to evolve to start to be relatively better than the other communities in their vicinity? Well, it comes down to whatever behaviors are necessary to create that deterrent, whatever is necessary to make sure that happens every year. So us humans are the descendants of those who over this course of millions of years made the right decisions, or at least enough of us did to pass on our genes. <laughs> and so uh, we are the, uh, the end product of this process of evolution, a process of human evolution, a process though that has been misunderstood along the lines of causing us to become smart enough to create civility, when in reality, civility came on the scene and that allowed us the opportunity to start to be selected for more advanced abilities. So civility preceded hominid selection and defined the environment in which the rest of selection would start to take place. Claudius Dank, thank you, bye.